Hey, everybody. I'm Eric Christian Olson, and I'm here on behalf of Harvard Chan Sea Change and the Environmental Media Association, where I serve on the executive board. And this is part of a series that you've all come to know and love, and you've tweeted about it, and you've Instagrammed about it, and you've called your mom and dad and your aunts, and everyone's watching it. It's EMA Talks Real Science, in which we aim to give our viewers the opportunity to hear directly from scientists on an important climate, equity, environmental, and public health issues. Today, today is gonna to be a doozy. We're having a conversation with Dr. Peter Hybers and Ian Summerholder on climate change, agriculture, and food security. So first, Ian, my brother, is an actor, he's an activist, he's a philanthropist, he's an environmentalist, he's an entrepreneur. <coughs> There's literally no end and no limit to this man. He's also a fellow EMA board member Ian starred and helped create a new Netflix documentary called Kiss the Ground, which is a wonderful, inspiring, groundbreaking film that reveals the first viable solution to our climate crisis is through the regeneration of the world's soils. Dr. Peter Hybers is a professor of earth and planetary sciences at Harvard University, whose research interests lie in developing a better understanding of the climate system and its implications for society. Ongoing research involves interactions between volcanism and glaciation, trends, predictability of extreme temperatures, and the implication of climate change for food production. We also uh, went to school together. We both got our bachelor's of science at West Point, and then we both uh, went to MIT together where we were roommates and got our PhDs. That's a lie. He did that. I went to Pepperdine and majored in surfing and child psychology growth and development, which is why we have these talks, because he's the smartest person in the room. And uh, and that's why we're going to uh, ask questions to him instead of me. Uh, so let's kick it off. Peter, how do you do you go by doctor, professor? Do you go by Peter? Do you go yeah. by uh, mastermind of scientific knowledge? Yeah. What do you go by? Peter, Peter would be uh, preferred, please. Yeah. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Let's start off with just the basics then. Can you, can you speak a little bit about the link between our current agricultural practices uh, and that strong connection to climate change? With, with climate change and agriculture, it's, it's, there's, there's two directions, obviously, right? Um, our climate is changing. Uh, that's going to influence our ability to raise food. It's going to influence food security. It is causing changes in how we farm and how kind of reliable the outcomes are. Uh, in, the, in the other way, uh, our agricultural practices are often really energy intensive. And so that also leads to additional contributions to greenhouse gases and further changes in climate. And so we, we, we got to think about this in, in both directions. You want to talk about a thousand foot POV on specifically that, which is food production and food security. Like I'm a kid that grew up in Iowa and all my friends were corn farmers. Right. And if we look, for instance, at the role that climate change is playing in food production, I'll give you 2012 as an example when we had severe droughts and heat waves and we saw that corn production went down 20%. Can you speak to that as far as climate change on food security? Yeah, I mean, the 2012 uh, kind of uh, high temperatures and, and early season drought that, that uh, happened to, to U.S. maize farmers was, uh, was intense. Um, I, I've seen estimates as much as a 40% reduction. Um, you know, the, the, the thing to put into perspective there is a 40% reduction in 2012 was throwing us back to 1980 levels of yields. Wow. And so, so the, the, the U.S. farmers and, and globally were getting more food off of the land. Uh, that's through intensification largely. And so in some ways that's good because we don't need to use more land to grow a certain amount of food. But then there's a broader question of, is this the right food to be growing? Is this the right way to be growing it? Um, you know, I think in so much as you can get more food off of a given acre of land, great. Uh, but, but then let's think about all the other downstream consequences. How much pesticide are you using? How much carbon emission is that causing? Uh, how much net health or nutrition are you generating by growing this type of food at this, at this time and place? Um, and, and so those are, uh, those, those are important issues. Um, and one of the things I'm most concerned about, we're thinking about US agriculture, right? Um, it's gonna get warmer. Uh, we've locked that in. And the question is how much warmer and how quickly? 
And it's going to get warmer faster over land than it is over the globe as a whole because land warms up more than the oceans. When we come into equilibrium, the land will have warmed a lot more than the oceans. And, and the simple reason is this, that the ocean can continue to evaporate and it's always losing heat at the surface that way. The land, it only evaporates in so much as there's moisture that's available. Sure. Once that moisture goes away and you have high temperatures, uh, it's really hard to grow crops. And so things like droughts, uh, are, are going to, you know, in so much as we cause more of them or larger droughts, uh, like we're worried about in the Southwest, like we saw in the Midwest in 2012, uh, that, that severely uh, hinders ability to grow food. And it comes as a shock. You might do it fine one year and the next year, you're not. Uh, the other thing is that the overall climate is changing. We're gonna need to migrate where we're farming, how we're farming. Uh, you can't migrate the soils though. And so there's a, you know, there's only so much you can do in terms of uh, certain types of adaptation. Also, too, the warmer the temper, the warmer, sorry, the warmer the surface temperature of that land. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people what they don't understand is that by building these own sort of microclimates, that warm air is actually pushing weather away. It's pushing the rain away because it's actually pushing up that moisture and it's going elsewhere. And that is this compounded effect that's happening over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you guys talked about the Dust Bowl and, and uh, you kissed the ground and that, you know, scientifically, we still don't fully, it's hard to understand how something of, of the magnitude of the Dust Bowl happened. You know, we, we think it has something to do with rainfall patterns and sea surface temperature kind of influences on how those rains fall. But then there's these feedbacks like you're talking about. And, and once the ground, loses its ability to evaporate, to sweat, to, tr to transpire, uh, you, you, you really radically change the, uh, the, the local surface conditions and then the local meteorology. Yeah, and, and that, that, that caused a, you know, a huge, huge, huge issue. Also too, you know, if, you, if you look back from say the 1870s to the 19, 1900, you know, the United States military set out to destroy 60 million head of buffalo to subjugate the Native Americans. And when you think about the, when you think about taking off this, in this crucial foundational component of what kept everything in balance, um, you can only imagine what happened to, to the topsoil, what happened to to, to, to soil, but at scale, right? I mean, if you look at the, where that area was, um, compounded with what was then becoming modern agriculture, compounded with surface temperatures or, or climate you know, changes, shifts, it was this perfect sort of storm that created quite an enormous uh, problem and it changed, it changed the country. Yeah, we've radically changed the surface of the earth. Uh, you know, we, we, we have appropriated most of the natural resources to our ends, right? Most of the water, most of the arable land is used to uh, grow food for us. Uh, you know, we're, we're emitting about 10 billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere every year. Um, you know, and, and so that, that combines with oxygen and so you end up with around 35 uh, billion tons of CO2 in the atmosphere additional. And that most of it is industry. Most of it is burning fossil fuels. Most of it is kind of the way that we generate and use energy around the globe continuously. But, but there's a, a big part of it, about 20% that has to do with our agriculture. And I think one of the, one of the things that, that uh, you're doing Ian, which, which is great, is to focus in on, look, each one of these components is, is really important and there's a lot that can be done. Mm -hmm. And so that 20% that, that is associated with agriculture, uh, a lot of that has to do with practices that aren't necessarily optimal uh, and can be re-envisioned uh, in ways that can be more conducive to stabilizing our atmospheric CO2 levels. And ultimately what we need to do is draw them down to avert continual climate change. Um, you know, what, what, one of the facts that to me, is I, I study kind of long-term climate change. And so, so one of the facts is, if, if you put CO2 into, into the atmosphere, and 
we just leave it there. Uh, a lot of it's going to go into the oceans. A lot of it's going to go into the land eventually. But the way that that works is that about 10% gets left in the atmosphere for a really long time. And we're talking centuries and millennia. So it's essentially right. permanent alteration of the composition of, of our atmosphere, which is going to cause climate change uh, for a very long time. And what we're having now is the Earth is heating up, coming into a new thermal equilibrium with the fact that we've altered our CO2 composition of our atmosphere. That composition is continuing to change and our kind of thermal equilibrium in terms of where we're heading is continuing to change. And we need to bring this into control. Um, you know, eventually we're going to bring it into control. The question is uh, how soon? And the sooner we can do it, uh, the more suffering can be averted. Uh, and so that's, I think that's the conversation that at least I'm, I'm most keen about is, is how do we alleviate uh, suffering? Um, how do we make sure that the effects of climate change uh, are, are minimized in as much as possible uh, while not causing harm in the attempt to control climate? And, and so, so there's, a, there's a kind of a complex uh, mediation that needs to happen there in terms of where our priorities as a, as a society. One interesting thing, Peter, I think that, uh, and you probably know this, but when we start sort of peeling back the, the, the onion, so to speak, of, okay, so we, we, we know where we are right now, right? How do we get to draw down? What are the actual steps going to be to bring into light what you call, um, which is a beautiful word, which is equilibrium? How do we get that back? So, draw yeah. down, drawing down enormous amounts of carbon um, from that from that teraton of carbon up there is obviously going to be incredibly difficult, um, and that's what I think that legacy load that we've put up there. I think is what people don't recognize is that's still up there. So to draw that down put it back safely into where it belongs in the soil is going to be a big, big, big component. But when you start to look at, all right, who are the people who are actually going to do this? Now, obviously, when China, India, Russia, and the United States, France is already doing bits and pieces of it and say the EU, when they change to even 20% regenerative agriculture, the world will shift on its axis. The, the amount of carbon that we can sequester will be enough to start tipping the point backwards. But who are these people? Let's just talk about the United States. These are where the stats get really interesting. So, you know, if you look in between these giant coasts, right, we have what people call the flyover states, which I personally think that they're the heartland. They're not the flyover states. They are the beating heartland of the United States of America. And I lived in Kentucky for a year and, and I, I, I you know, knew a lot of the farmers there. It, it's, yeah. It, so, I, so you I, get I, it. I, yeah. and, 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 but one thing that, you, that we don't, people can't really understand is, and this is just going back, we learned shooting, making this film over seven years. Ask yourself, how many farmers basically farm the entire United States of America? You look at, global farmers, and you look at the United States, the number is 1 million. There are 1 million people that actually have control of the vast majority of this farmland. Not a lot of people when you look at their seven and a half billion of us. It rests in the hands of 1 million people and by empowering them and, and giving them the tools to innovate and replace the soil microbiome back into the soil uh, and start growing really healthy food, polycultures, none of this mon monoculture, you know, I lead, it's the only word I can use is crap because it's not, it's devoid of, of nature. And um, so that's exciting. Yeah. Do you wanna to speak to that as far as rethinking and innovation for agricultural practices to help tackle climate change? Your thoughts on that, Peter? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, one, one of the basic things is that agriculture is an exciting area right now. I mean, with, with what can be done, the new technologies, um, precision agriculture, uh, hydroponics, um, really thinking about how the nutrition of what we're growing uh, is altered by the soil, the weather, by different cultivars. Not thinking about it just as kind of calories, but in an entire kind of health chain in terms of uh, what we produce, how we get it to the right places, uh, who's eating it, uh, reducing waste. 
there, there, there's there's a really a, a lot a lot of fascinating stuff. Um, I'm teaching a class right now on human environmental data science, and one of the students is estimating how much roof area there is across the U.S. that could support agriculture on rooftops, so you could have local uh, agriculture in urban areas. Which it's just and that's like these are big numbers. There, there, there's there's a lot that could be done, and it's exciting stuff. Um, and in some ways, it it reminds me of uh, you know, opportunities to, to repower the world with renewable energy uh, is super exciting as well. Uh, wind, solar, and we've seen these kind of exponential growth in terms of their installation. Uh, and, and we've seen that they're the wave of the future. Um, you know, we were talking earlier a little bit about, about balance and I was initially thinking in, in terms of thermodynamic balance, right? How, how do you achieve like an energy equilibrium on, on, on the planet? Before we get to a thermodynamic balance, we're going to need to come to some sort of political balance. And, you know, we, we don't, you can't cast this as haves and have nots, right? There, there are farmers who have figured out how to feed the United States and much of the world uh, in the Midwest, and they've been incredibly successful. Now, they've had a huge amount of support. There's been subsidies. Uh, there have been technological innovations. There's been revolutions. There's been appropriation of environmental resources, all of which are at a, an you know, unimaginable scale in some ways. Um, but but there's, there's been real success and real reason to be proud of, of much of what they've done. The thing is, it's not sustainable in the long term in, team, in terms of needing to come to a thermodynamic equilibrium. So how do you do this fairly? How do you how do you do this in a way that's inspiring and leads people to kind of reimagine, reinvent, to take new risks and new opportunities um, w without making it uh, a zero sum game of, of haves and have nots. Um, and and you know on, on a, this this on a global scale, this is also what what, what gets me right like. The, the World Food Program has super sad statistic. Over the last few years, the people who are living in food insecurity has gone up again. You know, for decades it was going down, and in the in the last few years, now now it's, it's going up. There are more children who don't know where they're going to be getting their food, more parents who don't know how they're going to be feeding their kids across the world now than there was a couple of years ago, and and that's not right either. And and so. <laughs> there, there's this human element, there's this political element, and there's this thermodynamic element, and, and how we reconcile the science and, and the engineering and the policy together, that, that's that's a big conversation. And, and so I'm, I'm glad we're having this a little bit here, but I, I, I'm just, I'm kind of pulled in all sorts of directions when, whenever I'm thinking about any one of these concepts. Can I, can I mention one really quick thing to piggyback on that? Yeah. I... So one of the interesting things I, I've learned, and I've spent a lot of time in Washington um, for years, um, up until the last pretty much three years, but for, for seven out of the last 10 years, I had a political strategist and lots of people working directly under not just President Obama, but people that worked for, for George W. and a lot of really great people. But one thing I learned in the last seven years, um, and particularly in making this film, was that Rarely are you going to have a politicized argument about farming or taking care of the farmers and the people that feed us. So, so there is a very unique, because right, if you look at this as like, a, it's a systemic problem, right? So we have to look at this, obviously, like you just said, from multiple access points at all given times and figure out how to fuse this as opposed to everyone working in silos and sort of labeling haves and have nots. One of the unique components of this is that no one's ever going to argue with you about feeding each other in the world and our families. They're just not. So we found this really unique um, politis, political proof um, access point. And one thing that one thing that we got out of this was a tremendous amount of support from both sides, right? it lends itself, whether it's France or whether it's the United States, we'll use the United States because that's where that's our home country. And we've also just gone through a very big uh, political shift, which is 
there's a lot of reaching out across the aisle when it comes to agriculture. And, and that is fascinating because it's bridging the gap between young and old people who come from completely different backgrounds, completely different places, but they're now sitting together physically and you know, metaphorically at the table. So all of a sudden, everyone has a seat at the table. And that entry point is where you know, we are going straight for that entry point. Um, to me, it's like a, a, a wormhole right into the future. That has been really exciting. Um, Republicans, Democrats, all talking about this as something that's really powerful, reaching across the aisle, and it's something that they can agree on. And it's not just the policymakers that are going to change this. This is on the ground consumers, chains, whether it's the big you know, retailers. But at the end of the day, when every young person or every millennial or every Gen Z demands that every piece of spinach they eat, every chickpea they eat, every piece of broccoli they eat, every you know, pita chip they eat come from a regenerative farm, then the world will literally shift in its access. And the economic, the economics behind that, because of course, in any type of conservation, particularly when you're dealing with conservatives, or in this case, in the United States, um, a more of a Republican uh, a group of individuals, you, in any situation, you have to find the sound economics of conservation. You have to. And I think in this particular sense, just like you said, the agricultural space right now is the hotbed of that. And to me, that is the most exciting part of it. And I'm telling you, man, the conversations we're having with both members of uh, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are profound and they are across the board together. So I think we, we, we have some sort of unity there because you can agree on the scientific side of that, you know? Right, right. I, you know, I, I had the, the, the real uh, privilege of getting to work at um, the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the Obama administration in uh, 2013. So I, I was a senior climate advisor. I worked with John Holdren, who was the president science advisor for, for eight years. Um, and, you know, I, I was blown away by how professional, how um, engaged people were there. Uh, and, and one of the things I'm really hopeful about is uh, with the president administration coming in, that they, they, they really care about the policy. They care about getting the science right. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there's real opportunities, like like you were saying, food brings people around the table. There's a lot that can be done in this space. And, and so it, you know, a couple of things, um, you know, if we align our subsidies to talking about making farms more resilient to bad weather and to climate change, if, to preserving soils, if we talk about aligning our subsidies so that we improve people's health uh, in terms of what what we're creating. If we really think about the total cost of what we're doing and integrating that up, and that, that you know, it's not just how much it costs to grow something, but then it's the transport of it. It's what people eat. It's how healthy or not healthy does that food make people and the eventual kind of uh, healthcare implications. And then there's the global implica implications, kind of our planetary health of, of the, the CO2 emissions. And this kind of integrative thinking uh, that, that reaches across kind of all these different domains. I, that's, that's where the conversation needs to be. And so I'm, I'm you know, kind of glad to hear you talking about that as well. I, I'd really like to move forward in, in thinking about how to make things better for everyone. It's a perfect segue to have this because I think one of the things that's important about these talks is, listen, we're talking about government, we're talking about subsidies. I think if we, you know, from conceptualization in abstract form, to action steps to meet challenges. The people yeah. watching this, what is the things they can do on a regular basis? Like, you know, when, when because, you know, the government's probably not gonna watch this video, but you're gonna get, you know, a half a million viewers that are. What are the action steps for the people? How do they change corporations? How do they change? You know? Well, well, one thing, and I think Peter, we can all agree on is, um, When you, when, you, when you show people, by the way, empowered consumerism is what's gonna change the world. It's not policymakers for the most part. It's 
<laughs> it's hopefully scientists and smart consumers. And an empowered, conscious consumer who can buy something that they can afford. But to know that every day they step out of their home, that they have the greatest vote in the world, which is they have the choice, the vote of their dollar. Who are they going to spend their hard earned money with? Are these companies that are good stewards of the environment? Are they companies that, that throughout their supply chain are not only conscious and aware, but not just sustainable, but regenerative? I mean, this is gonna start to change. And the big Fortune 500, Fortune 50 companies are going to become very hip to that very quickly. And they already kind of are, but it has to become affordable. And that's what happened with the whole, you know, organic uh, movement, which was, you know, I grew up very poor in Southeast Louisiana. I mean, we had everything we needed, but we were definitely in the poverty line. I didn't know that because we were just happy, right? We had what we needed, but my family, we would have never been able to go to a Whole Foods um, and, and buy everything that, that I'm buying now. It just never would have happened, but we didn't need organic because it was 1985 and people were growing things locally that were organic or came from my grandparents' farm. You didn't have these polluted food systems to think about. So now we are actively asking our Gen Zs and our coming generations to grow up to be healthy, happy people, to make healthy, happy choices and build a healthy, happy society. Pardon my French, how in the hell are we gonna do that with a food system that's completely broken? With, you know, with bureaucrats and policymakers who are unable to come to, to, to an, an agreement. So with Kiss the Ground, one of the things we're doing, this is really exciting, we're launching this at the end of, 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 of January. We cut together a 45 minute educational version of the film. Um, we're releasing it to 250,000 teachers and it's becoming available, I think, the day after inauguration, it's becoming available to 30 million students in the United States for free. And it, that, when I, we finally finished the, the cut and I saw it, I had chills and I had tears in my eyes because I realized as a young kid to sit, well, obviously now virtually, but to sit in your classroom with your peers and see this information in front of you with, cool graphics and animations and things that connect you to these very powerful elements, which are soil microbes and carbon, and to see all these people, to recognize that the, the gut biome of the human body is directly related to the health of that human being. The gut biome and the, the soil biome of the earth is directly related to the health of the earth. So it gives this double whammy of a connection, people being connected to the planet because you recognize our gut is what creates our health. The soil is what creates the health of the planet. Um, and the microbiomes in our bodies, it's when you eat kale, it's, you know, it's not, you're not just digesting kale. Your microbiomes are breaking it down and whatever they're pooping out, the poop has to stay in the loop, is what we're digesting and what we're, we're thriving on. So this is a really exciting time. I'm humbled and honored to be sitting here talking to you about this because this is, I think, and I say this wholeheartedly because I believe it, I honestly think this is the serious, this is the revolution, or I should rephrase that, this is the evolution of what we are about to see of the new modern agriculture. And, and nothing brings more joy to my, to, my, to my heart than knowing that our kids collectively, um, uh, Eric, kids, are my child's like, they're her best friends, they're her cousins, right? They're, he's Uncle Eric, I'm Uncle Ian. Our kids will collectively grow up in a system that is infinitely healthy, healthier than it would be had we not stepped in. I don't mean that from an egotistical standpoint. I'm saying, Peter, you are teaching people, you're showing people the way you're, in your tireless efforts of what you've decided to do with your life to share this information on a policy, I mean, on this policy level, on a, on, a, on a university level. And then we're kicking this to those young people. So imagine what your department is gonna look like in 10 or 15 years. 
with this new ushering of all this information, data, and science. It's kind of huge, guys and gals. I mean that collectively. I mean, I think this is like the start of something. And I don't mean it in some, you know, BS, LA, you know, Hollywood kumbaya thing. I mean, this is real data. This is real science. This is what we've spent almost a decade doing. And um, I think that people understanding that we are not separate of our environment, we are the exact same biological process is something that is going to take the world by storm. And I think now with COVID, people are really turning to composting and farming. Even if you have a, 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 a fire escape, you know, uh, you can, people are now building community composting centers. I mean, just like you said with the rooftops, there is a tremendous amount of surface area. Even people building a four, four foot by four foot garden in their backyard with, you have 250 million people doing that around the world. Think of that carbon capture on a daily basis. So it's exciting times. I'm, you know, I get emotional about this stuff because it's what I, it's what I live doing. And although I don't have uh, multiple PhDs, <laughs> I would like that, that would be cool. Yeah, yeah, there, there's, there's so much I think it's going. And, and then the academic parts of it, I, I think help. We, we can better quantify, we can better understand the system. But ultimately, a lot of what needs to be done is, is known. You know, how do we reduce our, our carbon emissions? How do we make people healthier? And that just takes a lot of work and a huge amount of organization and, and teaching and learning and outreach. And so this, this is a, you know, a, a, another really important step uh, towards reaching a, a better world. You know, I, I, you, you brought up COVID-19. It, it's, it's like elephant in the room still. Um, if one thing comes out of this whole COVID-19 pandemic uh, that, that makes me slightly hopeful is that it, 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 it forces us to understand that we're part of the environment and that we're all so connected with each other. You know, what, what, what happens in another country has direct implications for our, our own well-being. Yeah. And it, it mirrors the climate problem. You know, you, you emit carbon in one place. It doesn't just stay there. It goes around the whole world. And right. the way that we interact with each other, the way that we coordinate, the, the, the way that we um, build our future has to be done in a cooperative way. And it has to be done understanding that we are a, par a part of the environment. We, we're not going to control this thing. We need to work together, uh, both as people and as you know, inhabitants of this planet. And so there's, there's an awful lot that needs to be done. And I'm hopeful we're, we're, we're going to do it. It's happening. I mean, I, I'm, I am hopeful as well. And, you know, thanks for sharing your, your energy and expertise because, you know, Eric and I talk about this stuff a, a great deal. And I think a lot of us do, but the elephant in the room has also been climate change. We always, just people shut down. And I think that's no longer going to be the case. Things are really, really, really changing. And you know, when you when you when you talk about this new world of farming, and these are going to be some really intense conversations that we're going to end up having with John Deere and these big you know ag, ag companies. Modern agriculture was not designed for the betterment of the soil. Unhealthy soil leads to an unhealthy plant, leads to an unhealthy person, leads to an unhealthy climate. So, so the idea of not tilling of not breaking the soil, because when you break and damage soil, it releases carbon dioxide. And, and I'm sure you remember um, when, when Ray Archuleta, who's a huge hero of mine, is talking about those computer models, you know, we had to change the data every year because the climate is changing so quickly that we, every year that we were in post-production, we had to keep changing these climate models and the data because the, the carbon just kept going up, 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 up. But when you see, in April, that NOAA or NASA satellite image of all the plumes of carbon coming up, that red and orange swirling around, swirling around in April, you know, March, April, May, when everyone's tilling, right? And then by June, July, August, you see all of that red and orange go away. It starts turning to blues and greens, which means that's oxygen coming up. And you realize what's happening in those moments, in those months. The plants are growing, the crops are growing. It's that simple. So um, I, you know, I can't wait to the next conversation we have.
even if it's in a couple months, we should be much farther down the road. And uh, thanks, man. Here, 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 here's the challenge I, I, want, I, want, to, I want to put to you. Uh, how, how, how do you make this long-term? How do, you, how do you achieve a long-term balance? Is it, you know, the earth is breathing in and out every, every year. Uh, right. And we can, we can alter that balance a little bit. But, but I, honestly, here, here's the thing that I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about. We, we, we are diligently extracting carbon from deep, fossil reservoirs. And we're putting into the atmosphere. Okay. Now, to get that back down you, permanently, is 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 a big challenge and yeah. so you, you're, you're going you know you can put it into so you can put a lot of carbon into soils to keep it in those soils you have to really change the equilibrium forever uh and and that and so that that, that that's a that's a big transformation and so you take steps uh and and i think i think one part of that solution really is putting more carbon back into soils um and uh, I'm excited to see just how much of a solution that, that can be grown into. Ian, Peter, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today on EMA Talks. These are such fascinating conversations and such complex information. Uh, and you guys did a, a great job of making it digestible. Uh, and tune in for, for the next EMA Talks. We'll be right here continuing to platform science. Thanks, guys.